What on earth is this? We've all made mistakes in our workplace. We've missed a deadline, we've sent an email to the wrong person, we've referred to a client by the wrong name, you know the drill. It leaves a pit in your stomach and can make you feel viscerally unwell, particularly if your job is a high pressure one. And while they can happen anywhere and at any time, would you be surprised if I told you that this fairly standard looking power line in the extreme northwest of Germany was once the site of one of history's greatest workplace blunders, where one slip up during a routine, highly localized procedure involving these cables caused a disastrous runaway domino effect that affected people and businesses across all of Europe and even into North Africa. Yeah, your little typo doesn't seem so bad now, does it? As I said, I'm in the extreme northwest of Germany, near the Dutch border in the North Sea, and this is the Ems power line cross Crossing, a power line that crosses the River Ems. How did they think of that name? It was constructed in 1975 and formed part of Germany's mammoth power transmission network, which carries electricity back and forth across the country for German consumers and also sent it off into the interconnected grids of neighboring countries. Also, just to say, I'm really sorry that the footage of the Ems power line crossing is so dark. Um, I just I arrived way too late and I didn't realize that my drone and camera were going to be so unhappy with low lighting. It's the first time I've really done a, a late evening shoot. So, yep, that's my bad. Apologies. It's a high voltage line running at 380 kilovolts, which is the voltage used for large flows to transport power from generators to consumers. Europe is covered in an international spider web of these high voltage lines. For years, this section of Germany's grid, including the Ems power line crossing, was operated by Eon Nets. Eon Nets is, or was as it doesn't exist anymore, an example of what's called a transmission system operator, or T. TSO. For reference, and as an example, if you're in the UK, your TSO is NISO, it used to be National Grid. If you're in the Netherlands, your TSO is Tenet. And if you're in the US, your TSO is a complex clusterfuck of different companies, because why the hell not, eh? Competition drives innovation, innit? Just ask all those Texans whose grid couldn't withstand two inches of snow in 2021. Also, if you're a German and you're laughing at the Texans, don't, because your grid is also a weird jigsaw puzzle of different TSOs. Just for the sake of transparency, I actually happen to be an energy journalist, so this topic is very much in my wheelhouse, and I will try my absolute best not to let this video slip into unnecessarily dorky tangents that aren't crucial to the story. The Ems crossing stretches between two massive pylons on either side of the river. It has a span of 405 meters or 1,300 feet and used to have a clearance or height of 84 meters or 275 feet. This was changed to 110 meters in 2007 and you're about to find out why. You might be thinking, why not just go under the river instead? To which I respond, sure, are you willing to pay? because I guarantee you, no matter how expensive these were, it would have been orders of magnitude more expensive to build cables underground, and particularly under a river. From the jump, there was one big issue with the location of this crossing, and that's that it's just downstream of the dockyard of Maya Werft, builders of some of the largest cruise ships in the world. They're built here at the dock in Papenburg before ambling their way down the Ems and into the North Sea. Because these ships are so gigantic, the clearance between them and the cables was often pretty low, and so when a new ship was heading downstream from the dockyard, Maya Werft would call ahead and ask Eon Nets to switch the power line off to avoid any collisions that might take down the line and saute a couple of sailors in the process. On the 18th of September 2006, Maya Werft contacted Eon and said, hey, at around 7pm on the night of 4th of November we're launching a massive new cruise ship called the Norwegian Pearl. It's an absolute banger of a ship, but it's also absolutely massive, so can you switch off your scary death lines a few hours after that at 1am on the 5th of November? Or whatever all of that was in German. Eon thus had six weeks to do the required calculations and ensure that the line could be isolated and switched off with no problem. According to a much later report about this incident, Eon calculated that the scenario, if it went ahead as requested by Maya Werft, would not violate what's called the N-1 criterion. Okay, I lied when I said this wouldn't get nerdy. The N-1 criterion is basically a rule that ensures that if one component of a grid, like a line or generator, fails, other nearby elements of the grid can still handle the redirected power supply without sustaining damage. It's a rule used all over the world in order to avoid cascading failures across a grid. Maybe you can see where this is going. After the request from Maya Werft, Eon had contacted Dutch TSO Tenet and the other neighboring German TSOs to ask them to do their own N-1 criterion analysis, as the interconnected grids meant that a failure at Ems could mean a failure in other parts of Germany, the Netherlands, or even further afield. Maybe you can see where this is. Eon's N-1 calculations may well have been correct for the initially requested 1am shutdown, but on the 3rd of November, one day before the launch of the Norwegian Pearl, Maya Werft contacted Eon and asked to move the shutdown forward by three hours from 
1 a.m. on the 5th of November to 10.10 p.m. on the 4th of November. And Eon, for reasons only they know, said yes. Maybe you can see this decision immediately invalidated their previous N-1 calculations, as 10pm is a period with much higher demand than 1am. You know, people are still awake, plenty of businesses are still open, and transport is still running. Eon's N-1 analysis now needed to be updated for the new time slot with only 24 hours to go. But woo boy, it got even worse. They did actually manage to update their calculations in time and decided that the switch off could still go ahead, but they made two massive, massive errors. First off, they didn't tell the neighboring grid operators, Tenet and RWE, that the time had been changed until 7 p.m. on the 4th of November, three hours before the ship was due to pass under the line. The 24 hours Eon had to recalculate their N-1 analysis was already pretty tight time-wise, but three hours was literally impossible. Not telling Tenet and RWE about the time change until the very last minute was a genuinely baffling thing to do and garnered Eon absolutely scathing criticism in the final incident report. The other mistake that Eon made was that their new N-1 analysis analysis was just incorrect. They calculated it wrong. <laughs> their new rushed figures found that their own grid was protected from failure, and they clearly saw this and went, okay, all good, let's do this thing. But a key element of N-1 analysis is that you also have to be sure that whatever you're doing will not adversely affect any part of the network, including neighboring grids, not just your own. And the fact that the neighboring grids also do their own N-1 analysis doesn't matter. The overlapping calculations adds redundancy and thus a safety buffer. So Eon got it wrong. And meanwhile to the south, RWE rushed through their analysis, which they also got completely wrong, and thus the green light was given when it really shouldn't have been. So at 9.38pm on the 4th of November, the first of the crossing's two lines was switched off, followed by the second one minute later. Within seconds, Eon received a series of warnings that other lines in the region were now being overloaded, but pressed on anyway. This is partially because RWE had contacted them around this time to reassure them that flows were still manageable. But at 10.05pm, the Landesberg and Werendorf line, the line which actually connected the Eon and RWE grids, experienced a massive 100 megawatt surge in power, pushing the load on the line past 1,795 amperes, the limit at which a warning is issued signaling an imminent line failure on RWE's system. Realizing the scale of the issue, this warning prompted RWE to immediately ask Eon for an emergency intervention. Within five minutes at 10.10pm, 10 Eon had rushed to its end of this overloaded line, the substation at Landesbergen, and attempted to ease the load on the line by coupling what are so-called bus bars, conductive pieces of metal that can be used to manually redirect flows to other parts of the grid. In a frantic sprint to save the line, however, they rushed the process and assumed that coupling the bus bars would reduce flow to the line by about 80 amperes, which would give them enough breathing room. Instead, Eon dispatches at the substation watched as the newly coupled bus bars actually increased the flow by 67 amperes, pushing the load on the line to well over 2,100 amperes, the limit at which RWE's substation at the other end of the line would trip and automatically turn itself off to prevent further damage and click. The line went dead. It's true. One dead electrical connection doesn't sound like the end of the world. But to zoom out for a second, the interconnected European transmission grid, finalized in the 1950s, was originally built to ensure a secure power supply across countries. But in the 90s and 2000s, the grid became a platform for transferring huge amounts of power quickly across Europe, driven by market needs and the rise of renewable energy like wind power, which fluctuates wildly in short spaces of time. As a result, daily grid operation became much more complex and different national networks became increasingly interconnected and required careful balancing at all times. And in such an intensely interconnected multinational network, if one grid operator doesn't do their N-1 criterion correctly, all hell breaks loose. So after the Landesberg and Werendorf line went down, next to fall was the bielefeld ost Gütersloh line, then the bechtes dissen elsen line. As each line was tripped, the flow for that line was redirected onto another line, overloading it and tripping it, which would then overload and trip the next one. Rinse and repeat. For obvious reasons, grids across Europe, hundreds of miles away from the Ems power line, had not expected to be dragged into Eon and RWE's little experiment to find out what happens when you f*** everything up, and thus were not even remotely prepared for the cascade of tripped connections heading their way. Within 15 seconds, the trips had reached Austria. One second later, they'd made it to Hungary, Romania and Ukraine. Two seconds later, they hit Spain, knocking out its interconnector with Morocco. In less than half a minute, the bus bar blunder intended to reverse the overload in Germany had turned some or all of the lights off in almost 30 countries from Greece to Portugal. But just as the entire continent was on the brink of a total blackout, it got even weirder. The supply and demand experienced by the Europe-wide network is very finely balanced at a frequency of 50 Hz. This can safely deviate by 20 mHz in either direction, usually in response to higher or lower demand. 
but the cascade of tripped power lines caused the frequency in the western half and southeastern portions of Europe to drop by a full hertz, 50 times the maximum safe deviation from the standard frequency. And this caused a massive imbalance between them and northeastern Europe, who were unaffected by the cascade and thus suddenly had a mammoth surplus of power that it couldn't send anywhere, sending their frequency way up to 50.3 hertz, also far outside safe operating levels. And so, the protection mechanisms built into power lines, which were being tripped across the continent, caused the grid to suddenly split itself into three. Western, Southeastern and Northeastern Europe disconnected from each other and isolated their respective sections of the grid. Weird, isn't it? I mean, this is technically a stroke of luck as it split the grid up and kept Europe from a total blackout, but resynchronizing the grid of an entire continent is no mean feat. Meanwhile, tens of millions of people were left without power. Dozens and dozens of people were reported as being stuck in lifts and uh, hospitals that didn't have adequate backup generation were thrown into chaos. And, quote, hundreds of trains across northern Germany were delayed. But I would be surprised if anybody noticed the difference there. Honestly, the immediate effects of this blackout are not well documented. And within two hours, a cross-continental effort spearheaded by the Union for the Coordination of the Transmission of Electricity, or UCTE, which basically controlled European transmission at the time, saw power restored and the system carefully resynchronized, as doing it too fast could cause further damage. And everyone breathed a sigh of relief, until the EU picked up their newly repowered phone, gave UCTE a call, and asked, so why did we just experience a brief trial run of the apocalypse? Initially, this was going to be one of my shorter videos and more sort of lighthearted ones, but it's just so complicated and requires so much breaking down that the uh, electricity mafia, aka my bosses, uh, would probably have had a go at me asking why I left out grid synchronization. Basically, while the blackout could have been much worse, it's, it's absolutely crazy to me that a small, localized mistake was allowed to have such a gigantic impact on an entire continent. Almost all of the blame was placed on Eon Nets for their mad decision to approve the schedule change, but RWE's blind acquiescence also garnered them some flack too, and UCTE was called into question for failing to ensure adequate security mechanisms for such a tightly interconnected grid. And to some political leaders, the blackout showed that grid operators were no longer able to trust each other to operate reliably, and called for a unified authority to regulate all grid operators across the network. And a few years later, in 2008, they kind of got what they wanted in the form of ENSOE, which is an organization that basically represents all the grid operators in Europe and allows for more standardized rules and faster communication. And that's the story of how a cruise ship accidentally sent Europe back to the Bronze Age for a couple of hours in 2006. And to the Eon analyst who did the initial N-1 calculations for the Ems powerline shutdown, I hope finding a job wasn't too hard. Mm -hmm.